Hello and welcome to the second installment of Flipped Classroom for Ichthyology. This week we're going over what I'm calling Salmonids et al. So we'll be going over the Salmonidae family, then Clupeids, Hyodontidae, Osmeridae, Isosidae, Umbridae, and Gadidae. This video will be done in two parts, that way I can actually upload it to YouTube. This first part will be on salmonids, and the second part will be on all the other fishes. What we've seen so far in terms of ichthyology, and what we're going to be going over is represented in this tree here. So what we've seen so far, right, we've gone over the chondrichthys, which are shark skates and rays. Now we're moving on to osteichthys, which is the category for bony fishes, bony vertebrates. The sarcopterygians were the low-finned fishes, like coelacanths. Now we're moving on to the actinopterygians, which included the sturgeons, paddlefishes, and gars, right? Remember the ancestral fishes that we had in our last video lecture. Moving on to teleosteae, and today we'll be going over sauciforms, which are pikes, salmoniformes, which are the salmonid family. So today we'll be talking about salmoniformes, which is the order salmons and salmonids and smelt. Family is salmonidae. The subfamilies there are three. Salmoninae, so ide is the family ending, ine is the subfamily ending. We have salmon, trout, and char are in Salmoninae, and the genus, genii, that are in Salmoninae are Oncorhynchus, Salmo, and Salvolinus. And we have the subfamily Thymalinae which are the graylings in genus Thalmus, and then the final subfamily is Corrigonidae, which are white fishes in the genus Corrigonus or Prosopium. The Salmoniforms are the second largest family in Montana after the minnows, also known as Cyprinidae or Luciidae. There are 15 different species, 13 species and two subspecies. Nine of these are native and six are non-native. Their distribution is originally in northern latitudes and cold water, but now they're distributed worldwide. So focusing in on the Salmonidae family, right? Family Salmonidae. The subfamilies are Salmonidae by Malinae and Corgonidae, and then the list of all the genus you'll be learning about today. So we have these top three and these bottom three, but we don't have the genus Hucho. The genus Hucho is the largest salmonid on Earth. So the average length for Hucho or Taman is from 70 to 120 centimeters, which is 28 to 47 inches. The maximum size isn't totally known, but there was supposedly a fish caught in the Kutu River in Russia in 1943 with a length of 210 centimeters or 83 inches and a weight of 105 kilograms or 231 pounds. This is the largest size ever recorded for Hucho. The maximum length is about 150 to 180 centimeters, so 59 to 71 inches. And the IGFA world record is 41.95 kilograms or 92.5 pounds with a length of 156 centimeters or 61 inches. Usually these fish can reach at least 55 years of age. So the salmonid is not in Montana. However, it is the largest salmonid on Earth, which is a great little bonus question to know, hint, hint. 
So distinguishing features of the family Salmonidae include an adipose fin, a single dorsal fin, soft fin rays, pelvic fins in the abdominal position, and an axillary process on their pelvic fin. So that axillary process is a small triangular shape of skin at the front of the pelvic fin, and that's one of the defining features of Salmonidae. So the key features you should be looking at for species identification are distinctive colorations and spotting patterns, thinking about trout versus char versus salmon, specifically the size, color, and location of spots on the head, fins, and the sides. The mouth size on the fish and presence or absence of teeth, thinking about whitefish versus the rest of salmonids. The anal fin size, that will be used to distinguish Pacific salmon versus trout. Large scales, like those in the grayling or whitefishes, compared to smaller scales, like in the salmons or the trout. Brazy branchial teeth, looking at the cutthroat versus rainbow trout for those brazy branchial teeth. Eye shape, this is a common area to determine whether or not you have a whitefish and one versus two flaps on the nair or the nostril. You should read section 19.4 in your text and be sure to answer questions in the handout from your textbook. These questions will be fair game on any exams or your quiz that's due at the end of the week. So the subfamily Salmonidae are trout, salmon, and char. The first genus is Oncorhynchus, which are Pacific salmon and trout. The first Pacific salmon we have is the kokanee, Oncorhynchus nerca. So kokanee are landlocked sockeye salmon. So they do not swim out to the ocean, they're landlocked. They are non-native in Montana and were stocked and introduced for both forage fishing opportunities as well as um, predator fishing opportunities. So the kokanee salmon have many, many very closely placed gill rakers and they are planktivores. So remember we talked about the size and positioning of gill rakers determining not only what species a fish could be, but you can use that information to determine what the fish is eating. Kokanee salmon are fall spawners. They're semilparous, which means they die after they spawn. So semilparous means they die. Heteroparous means they spawn multiple times. And some strongholds in Montana are Flathead Lake and Hauser and Holter Reservoirs. Next we have the Chinook Salmon, Ungrinkus Toshika. These are in Fort Peck Reservoir and they are hatchery based. They are non-native. They're also a fall spawner and there's no natural reproduction in Montana, which you'll learn a bit more about this in the video after this slide. It might actually be somewhat surprising to think of Chinook salmon in eastern Montana, but the picture that I have on this slide is a picture of Dave Fuller and FWP out of Fort Peck showing a large Chinook salmon caught there. There's no natural reproduction, so they must be stocked as juveniles. They feed on abundant forage of cisco in the lake, and the population seems to fluctuate quite a bit depending on the stocking success. Every fall, a fish crew sets out to recreate nature. If we want to keep this fishery going, we're going to have to go ahead and put forth some type of effort, you know, to, to continue this fishery. In Montana, Chinook salmon are only found in Fort Peck Lake. But because the lake doesn't provide suitable spawning grounds, fish crews collect adult salmon and artificially reproduce them. They process, while not natural, its outcome 
can generate a lot of angling interest. You know, sometimes you get just as many calls about the salmon fishery as the walleye fishery for Fort Peck. Um, you know, people have come from Wyoming, North Dakota, the western part of Montana, you know, so it definitely draws a crowd. Through last decade's drought, salmon numbers declined, but with this year's record water levels, biologists are expecting a great year of salmon fishing. The other thing is, you know, we've had some really good Cisco, their primary forage these last, you know, three to four years, so all the conditions are right for, for growing big, healthy fish. This should be a boom for the local economy, as well as for anglers looking to catch a unique, powerful fish found only in Fort Peck. These fish are, you know, in three to four years, they're, you know, 15 to 20 pounds. You know, I think it's something every angler should try and take advantage of if they get the chance. And it's right here in Montana. Next, we have West Slope Cutthroat Trout, O. Clarkii Lewisii, so Oncorhynchus Clarkii Lewisii. And recently, the designation of West Slope Cutthroat Trout and Yellowstone Cutthroat Trout is it's still somewhat up in the air, but now they are possibly identified as two separate species instead of two subspecies. So keep an eye out for that in future updates of the Montana Fishes app. In the Holton Montana Fish Field Guide, note that the Yellowstone Cutthroat Trout and the West Slope Cutthroat Trout in the pictures on page 42 are reversed. So make sure you're looking at these descriptions in the Montana Fishes app and if you happen to be using the Montana Fish Field Guide that those two pictures are reversed. So the West Slope Cutthroat Trout is native to Montana in the Columbia and Missouri basins. This can be difficult to distinguish from Oncorhynchus mycus, so rainbow trout. Trout can have faint cutthroat-like red throat slashes and the West Slope Cutthroat Trout can have a rainbow-like pink band along the side. Both have many small dark spots on the body. However, the West Slope Cutthroat Trout is going to have few to no spots on its head. And I think the best indication of whether or not you have a West Slope Cutthroat Trout is they're usually much more green than a Yellowstone Cutthroat Trout or a Rainbow Trout. Rock Creek. The race up Rock Creek is really a spin off the joint research to track cutthroat trout. So you can actually follow all the movement of these tagged cutthroat live as FWP is actually tracking them. Fish, Wildlife and Parks tracks these fish as part of a research project looking into how cutthroats use Rock Creek and its tributaries to survive. We'd never really track their movements to figure out what kind of habitats they were using for spawning and over summer and other times of the year. So we wanted to put radio transmitters out and fish to get a, a good feel for what type of habitats they were using those different times of year. Finding these critical habitats and possible obstructions to them will allow fish managers to conserve Rock Creek's West Slope cutthroats in the future. If we can identify obstacles that are either causing mortality or increasing the amount of time it takes to make that migration. And if we can improve through habitat restoration, these obstacles, then we can have real positive benefits on those fisheries. And this research combined with TU's Race Up Rock Creek allows the public to connect in real time with cutthroat conservation. So this is an example showing rainbow trout and cutthroat trout hybrids in the Flathead River. So here we have a pure rainbow trout and here we have a hybrid which we're saying this is a hybrid because of this orange coloration underneath the jaw of this other fish. West Slope cutthroat trout, one of Montana's native fish, exists in approximately 2% of their original range in the upper Missouri River drainage. Two of the causes for the West Slope's decline are competition and hybridization with non-native trout. But now the species is gaining ground thanks to a program that offers landowners the chance to give the fish a helping hand. The Candidate Conservation Agreement with Assurances is a provision under the Endangered Species Act which allows for the proactive conservation of species, hopefully preventing their need to be listed. What we did today is transfer a genetically pure population from a, a headwater stream to a stream on private property 
Uh, the stream that we transferred fish to doesn't currently have fish because non-native fish competitors to West Slope cutthroat trout were removed. This stream that we put fish into historically probably had West Slope cutthroat trout. Uh, we expect because of the, uh, the size of the stream, the quality of the habitat, and the fact that there's a reservoir uh, that the stream runs into, that this fishery will produce relatively large cutthroat trout and large numbers of cutthroat trout. Because of this landowner's willingness to enter into the agreement, today West Slope cutthroat trout have picked up seven miles of stream habitat in addition to a 40-acre reservoir. As it's been in the past and has proved once again today, private landowners play a critical role in the restoration of Montana's fish and wildlife. This is Mike Grunette at Among Montana's Fish, Wildlife and Parks. Yellowstone cutthroat trout, Uncorinthus clarkii rubiae, they are native to Montana as well. They are a spring spawner and they have basal branchial teeth that are present in their mouth. And that's one of the things you can use to distinguish them as a species. So the specimen in 5.4 has teeth that are very clearly shown. You should view that specimen under the dissecting scope. Specimen 5.4a is a greenback cutthroat trout from Colorado, which has few large spots near its tail, and contrasts this with the many fewer smaller spots on the West Slope cutthroat trout. You don't need to be able to identify the greenback cutthroat though. So the Yellowstone cutthroat trout, there's no specimen, but you should be able to identify the Yellowstone cutthroat trout from pictures. They're native to Montana, but only native in the Yellowstone River drainage. 20 years ago, you'd be hard pressed to see a native Yellowstone cutthroat trout make a spawning run out of the Yellowstone River. They spawn in the tributary streams, which either did not have water or were inaccessible because of uh, impassable culverts. So through the years, fish biologists improved passage and secured water through leases to more than double the number of tributaries that cutthroats use today. The combination of these actions has made this a real robust population of Yellowstone cutthroat trout. Even with these successes, the cutthroat has disappeared from historical strongholds because of climate change, forcing biologists to focus their efforts on the upper stretches of the Yellowstone River. We really are focusing our efforts in an area that is modeled to stay cooler longer. And our goal is to increase the resilience of the fish so that they can withstand what's coming at them and be around for future generations. And by conserving these native fish, FWP provides a unique angling opportunity and preserves Montana's past. To my mind and to many other people's mind, these are precious. These are our heritage. These are the fish that Lewis and Clark encountered when they came here. These are the fish that fed Teddy Roosevelt. And I like the idea that people can come from out of state and have a little taste of what Montana was. The pattern and distribution of spots is similar to the West Slope cutthroat trout, but the spots are larger and fewer, with more regular and less fuzzy outlines, more towards the tail and less near the head. Larger live specimens often have a yellowish color. They have brazy branchial teeth. They spawn in the spring. And unfortunately, the early biologists didn't recognize the difference between Yellowstone cutthroat trout and West Slope cutthroat trout. So both of those eggs were widely introduced throughout West Slope cutthroat trout range. And a lot of high mountain lakes with trout even within the West Slope cutthroat trout region in western Montana, there are actually Yellowstone cutthroat trout. Yellowstone cutthroat trout and West Slope cutthroat trout also readily hybridize with each other and with rainbow trout. So you can get a lots of weird admixtures. For example, you can catch cutthroat trout in highlight reservoir, but they're Yellowstone cutthroat trout. Yellowstone cutthroat trout and West Slope cutthroats are actually not that closely related, have been separated for a pretty long time. Yellowstone cutthroat trout are from the south, and West Slope cutthroat trout are from the west via the Columbia River. So even though they're found close together in some locales, there aren't, they aren't that genetically similar. The major management emphasis for Yellowstone cutthroat trout is the protection of remaining pure stocks 
and in some cases the removal of non-native trout and hybridized populations to restore native stocks. So pointing out here there's a variety of colors that you can see in the Yellowstone cutthroat trout. So we have this golden color and then this this fish is, well both of these fish are from Yellowstone Lake, but you can see how much more silver this fish is compared to this fish. So you can have the silvery coloration or the golden coloration. Really when you look at enough pictures of West Slope cutthroat trout versus Yellowstone cutthroat trout, you will be able to tell a difference. I also think that most West Slope cutthroat trout kind of top out in terms of their length and they become more football-like while Yellowstone cutthroat trout will get much longer in their native range. So Kurt Heim was a PhD student here working with Tom McMahon and he was researching fish movement in tributaries of the Lamar River in Yellowstone National Park and determining how the movement of Yellowstone cutthroat trout and rainbow trout in that drainage was contributing to hybridization in the Lamar River. And here are some pictures from his field work. He was able to create a key to determine whether or not a fish was a hybrid or a pure Yellowstone cutthroat trout. And one of the best features to look at is actually the leading edges of fins. More likely it is a hybrid when the leading edge of a fin is white compared to when it's a pure Yellowstone cutthroat trout, those leading edges of the fins are going to be the brownish yellowish color. David Stagliano has been trying to conserve Montana's declining western pearl shell mussel for the last decade. That's what we want to do is to hopefully reintroduce mussels into those watersheds that we knew they were there. We were on site and saw them and now they're gone. But past efforts to relocate adult mussels have failed. So Stagliano has another idea, never tried before in the West. If successful, it provides us an avenue to relocate mussels without actually moving mussels. Montana's western pearl shell mussel relies on the cutthroat trout to reproduce. After fertilization from the male, the female mussel expels the eggs out from her shell. The cutthroat sees this as bait and then ends up with the eggs on its gills. The trout moves through the stream as the mussels grow, eventually falling off onto the stream bed and become adults. Today, for the first time ever in Montana, Stagliano is trying to artificially create this process in the wild. So next we have the Columbia River red band trout. There is no definitive red band trout specimen in the collection, and 5.6 is a hatchery rainbow trout specimen. The Columbia River red band trout is native to the Columbia River drainage in northwestern Montana. Various hatchery strains of rainbow trout, originally from a California hatchery, were widely introduced into Montana and have developed into a self-sustaining quote-unquote wild population in many river systems. They're also widely stocked in reservoirs that lack spawning habitat to provide recreational fishing. So the Columbia River red band trout is a native species and a species of concern. It is a subspecies of rainbow trout. They are a spring spawner and their brazy branchial teeth are absent. So that's something you can use to determine whether you have a red band trout or a Yellowstone cutthroat trout in your hand. Their spawning pattern tends to have many more smaller spots all over the entire body, including all of the fins on the top of the head. Rainbow trout also have white-tipped pelvic fins. In contrast, the cutthroat trout tend to have fewer, larger spots and very few spots below their lateral line, and very few spots on the top of their head. So rainbow trout, Oncrancus mycus, are mostly coastal rainbow trout mixtures, but also mixtures of other stocks. They are non-native. They originated from hatchery stocking in the 1880s to the early 1900s and spread outward. They are also a spring spawner. So that timing of spawning between rainbow trout, cutthroat trout, Yellowstone cutthroat trout, and West Slope cutthroat trout, right, allows them to hybridize. 
The Missouri River between Helena and Great Falls boasts one of the best trout fisheries in the state. But in a recent study looking at the health of the trout population, researchers discovered a puzzling behavior. The previous study that we did with the radio telemetry with rainbow trout in the Missouri showed that they do not go back to the same area to spawn. Biologists previously believed trout, like salmon, returned to the same place they were born to spawn. But in a small study researchers found in the Missouri River system, rainbow trout would spawn in different places each year. So today they are undertaking a larger study to learn more about this unusual behavior. In this study we're using a different technology where we're tagging about 2,500 fish and we're uh, installing the tags in their natal streams, the streams that we know they respond in. And then we'll follow them over the next five or six years and see which streams they go back to to spawn. This new fish behavior knowledge will help conserve trout in Montana. Golden trout, Amphrinchus magus aguan bonita, are non-native. They're from California. They're also a spring spawner and they're mainly in high mountain lakes. They're one of the most colorful of all the salmonids. They're native to the Sierra Nevada in central California and were introduced to Montana on both sides of the divide. Many of these lakes were historically fishless. They have white borders on their paired fins and large spots that are restricted to a line from the anterior margin of the dorsal to the anterior margin of the anal fin. They have par marks for these dark, wide blotches on the sides of their body, and these often persist in adults. In other Oncorhynchus species, the par marks are present in juveniles but fade out as the fish gets older. I want you to note that the golden trout are mycus and considered to be an offshoot of rainbow trout. It became isolated in high mountains and developed into this unique subspecies. Next we have brown trout, Salmo tretta. Notice that we're moving from one genus, Oncorhynchus, now into a different Salmo. Brown trout are non-native, they're originally from Europe, they are a fall spawner, and they're in larger and warmer streams. Brown trout are found throughout Montana and the U.S. And early on you'll see references to German brown trout or Loch Lavens from Scotland. And FWP still uses the LL designation when they refer to brown trout as an abbreviation. Remember how we had the LL in our data detective lab the other week. Brown trout are in the genus Salmo, which is from the Atlantic drainages, so a totally different genus right, than Oncorhynchus, which is the Pacific genus. Brown trout and Atlantic salmon are predominant members of this genus. Brown trout are fall spawners. They lay their eggs in reds in October through November, and their fry emerge early the next spring. They have lots of variation in terms of their color, from brown, cream, yellowish, but mostly the brownish and orangish spots with white halos are the best thing to use as a distinguishing feature. They tend to favor deeper, slower rivers than rainbows and are more tolerant of warmer waters. So you can find them in lower river sections, even as far down as Billings on the Yellowstone River. They also do well in lakes and they're largely piscivorous as adults. So one thing to compare the brown trout, right, maybe we're getting the brown trout mixed up with the Yellowstone cutthroat trout because of this yellow coloration. The brown trout are not going to have a cut, right, that's the first distinguishing feature. And then additionally, they're going to have these orangey spots with halos. So this white halo around their spots is going to be a feature that you can use to distinguish this fish from the cutthroat trout. Montana's fish biologists are finding brown trout more frequently and in areas never seen before. Over the last probably 25 to 30 years, we've seen a pretty significant increase in abundance and a fair increase in the distribution over that short time frame. Brown trout were first stocked in Montana's Madison River in 1902. Over the course of the century, brown trout were stocked or found in most major Montana rivers. However, in the last 23 years, brown trout have rapidly expanded their range even further. 
even though brown trout are a really popular sport fish, um, especially in certain areas, they do pose threats to other fish, including other sport fish. One of the greatest threats we see them as is regarding conservation of some of our native fish. To try and learn what factors are allowing brown trout expansion, Fish, Wildlife and Parks and the USGS are currently conducting a study. And while findings won't be released till next spring, some of the early analysis points to climate change. Because the trends are so widespread, something big is affecting brown trout distribution. And that big thing is probably climate change. The actual mechanism we're not clear on. But even when fish managers learn of these mechanisms, the decisions about the expansion of brown trout will still be challenging. So the question becomes, how do we balance an expansion of a, a species like brown trout that's incredibly popular, along with the potential declines we're seeing with our native species? In 1918, a Fish and Game Commission report warned of how stocked brown trout were impacting native grayling. Now, almost 100 years later, fish managers will have to decide on what that commission called a dangerous denizen. Winston Greeley, out among Montana's fish. Next we have brook trout. Brook trout are from Eastern North America and were widely introduced throughout Western North America. They are Salvolinus fontanellus, which is a char. So the Salvolinus genus means char. They are also a fall spawner. So the Oncorhynchus are spring spawners, the Oncorhynchus trout, rather, are spring spawners. Salmo are fall spawners, and Salvolinus are fall spawners. Char found in polar regions, like Arctic char, lake trout. Their color is quite distinctive. They have red spots with blue halos, vermiculations, or these worm tracks on the top of their body white stripes on the leading edge of their fins. And they're really quite beautiful fish. They're one of my favorite fish. They also have these dark wavy lines on their dorsal fin. They're found pr primarily in small streams and they compete with cutthroat trout. They're pretty rare in larger rivers where rainbow trout and browns are common. They are piscivorous and can feed on other fish. So predation on native trout is an issue and that's mainly where uh, a lot of the competition exists. So here's another picture of the brook trout, the right leading edge here, white, this distinguishing feature. And if we're getting mixed up the brook trout and the brown trout, remember the brook trout have these vermiculations or the worms on the top of their body, and they have blue halos around their spots as opposed to white. Bull trout, Salvolinus confluentis, also a fall spawner, but these ones are native. Bull trout are native to Montana in the Columbia River and Saskatchewan drainages. They're listed under the federal ESA as a threatened species, as many management activities are here to protect and restore their populations. Like lake trout, they are piscivorous as adults, and they're a common top predator in large lakes and large rivers. They're highly migratory and have a salmon-like life history in that they migrate long distances out of lakes and large rivers and spawn in small headwater tributaries. Juveniles rear in streams for one to three years and then migrate downstream and start feeding on fish and attain large body sizes. Now many populations are confined to small headwater tributaries where they are relatively non-migratory. So the ways to identify a bull trout is that their dorsal fin is completely translucent. It has no black markings. So this is one of the features if you're trying to compare it to a brook trout. Their tail fin is slightly forked and the shortest ray is more than half the length of the longest. They do not have any dorsal vermiculations. And overall, they, they look more um, sleek and gray than brook trout. So comparing them to brook trout, they're much more gray, and they don't have vermiculations. There's another comparison of their colored up during spawning on the top here, and then during non-spawning periods, this sleek silver color. But remember, they don't have any 
patterns or vermiculations on their dorsal fin. Bull trout are one of the most threatened fish species in Montana, but state fish biologists are working to improve their odds. And there's certain places that are left that are strongholds, and what we can do is make those more resilient and make those populations stronger. One focus on bull trout is taking place in the Clearwater River drainage near Sealy Lake, where in just the last year, crews have removed major fish barriers and restored bull trout habitat. But what might prove to be the key for bull trout in this valley is the new Marshall Block Wildlife Management Area that will protect prime bull trout spawning habitat. And so in this drainage, we basically have opened up passage now for bull trout, and now we've purchased the land where they're gonna spawn, and now we're restoring the land where they're gonna be spawning, and that will just filter down through the clear water and all the way to the Blackfoot. These large-scale projects are already showing signs of success. Just this fall, bull trout numbers are up. See this one here? Which gives biologists hope that Montana's bull trout will once again be resilient in this area. The projects in this drainage, I mean, it's so, it's so unusual for the stars to kind of align like this between the land acquisitions, the restoration projects, this project. I feel pretty fortunate to work on these kind of projects that impact such a big scale and have tangible results. So here's comparisons of bull trout and brook trout. This is an example of one of the hybrids. Next we have lake trout, Sablanish Namakush. They are both native and non-native in Montana. So their native range are very high up in northern Montana, and then there's another native population here in southwestern Montana. Trout are native to Montana, but only in the upper St. Mary's drainage that flows into Canada and a couple of lake populations in southern Montana. They were once thought to have been stocked, but now are recognized as native. They're isolated, like grayling, in the glacial retreat. They have been introduced into large lakes as a top predator, a large sport fish, including Flathead Lake and Fort Peck. They're also an introduced species in Yellowstone Lake and are part of a major conservation issue in Yellowstone National Park, where the lake trout have preyed heavily on Yellowstone cutthroat trout and caused significant population declines in that lake. So for identification, you should note the spotting pattern on their operculum, their dorsal fin, and their deeply forked tail. They're fall spawners, they lay eggs in rocky reefs with good current, they were an apex predator in the Great Lakes, but lamprey parasitism has greatly reduced their numbers, hence the lamprey control program there, plus other restoration efforts in the Great Lakes. Holy slap! Last summer, fish biologists were amazed at what showed up in one of their traps, one of the rarest fish in Montana, a native lake trout. So one of the lakes in Montana where we have native lake trout. Uh, all of our other populations are of Great Lakes origin. More than three decades ago, retired fishery biologist Dick Oswald read an extraordinary claim. Two lakes in his area had native lake trout. With little evidence given to support this claim, Oswald turned to the emerging field of genetics for confirmation. And that is what really triggered us off to their origins. What the genetics showed was these lake trout were closely related to ones in Alaska and northern Canada and not related to those stocked in Montana from the Great Lakes. This made biologists theorize that during the last ice age, lake trout from Canada became trapped in parts of Montana. After the ice and water receded, these fish found isolated pockets where they survived. When you say relict populations, that's a perfect description for these lake trout. Okay. It's just incredible that they were able to hang on in these isolated pockets. It's a lake. Laker. Today, researchers catch these native lake trout yeah. through the ice to conduct a study that hopes to conserve these historic fish. I mean, that's my main emphasis. I just want to make sure that this population is around for the long haul. While these native lake trout face many challenges ahead, their current existence allows us to peek into Montana's past and glance at the history of its natural world. Winston Greeley, Adam. So another common fish to 
mess up is bull trout versus lake trout. So if I'm comparing a bull trout and a lake trout, bull trout have no mottled coloration on their operculum while lake trout have this splotching. Bull trout have way less of a forked caudal fin than lake trout. So lake trout have this deep fork while bull trout do not. And then once again, the bull trout have no coloration on their dorsal while the lake trout have this modeling pattern.